Uh, so we can go there now live. Melissa Thorpe is head of the Spaceport Cornwall. Hi, Melissa. Hi, thank you for having me. No, is it? This is exciting. This is exciting. So, when is this 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 rocket going to take off? Um, so we're tracking a launch in early October at the moment. Um, our launch window will open around the sixth of October, at which point we'll be ready to to get everything uh, up to space. And when you when you say you're you're tracking a launch, what what are you looking for? What are the conditions then for uh for, that may, mean you can go ahead with the launch? Um, so a few different things. We make sure obviously all the facilities are ready. Um, we make sure that the weather is good. We're a bit more flexible with weather being a, an air launch system. Make sure that our partners at Virgin Orbit have everything that they need. And as well as obviously all our, our satellite customers like, like Josh's team at Space Force, make sure that they their systems are integrated and, and ready in the rocket to, to get to space as well. So there, there's a few things, but you know this has been a, an eight-year project. So I think by the time October comes, we should have everything ready in place. In fact, you mentioned Joshua. So let's bring in Joshua Weston, a co-founder and chief executive of Space Forge. Uh, morning, Joshua. Hello. Nice to have you with us. Um, now, uh, you and we, we we spoke to uh, Space uh, uh, Space Forge a few weeks ago because you've built the the sat. You're based in. Remind me where you are. Where you are in Wales? Uh, we're just on the outskirts of Cardiff. Just on the Romney. outskirts of Cardiff, and you've built the satellite which is going up. Yes, we have. Yeah, so it's the first satellite designed and built in Wales, which we accomplished uh, in a national record of about five months. And how long does a satellite normally take? Uh, the previous national record was 14 months, but they can take anywhere from three years all the way out to 20 years when you get something as big as like the James Webb Space Telescope. So I was going to ask that, to put it in some context, how big is the satellite that you've built that's going up? It's about the size of a shoebox, but it is the smallest form factor where we can demonstrate the technologies we need to create the world's first returnable satellite. Yeah, no, explain this. So this is the difference, isn't it? Instead of, instead of an enormous thing going up, doing its business, then drifting off and becoming space rubbish... This is a this is a, a return. It's a sort of boomerang satellite. It can come back down. Uh, <laughs> maybe not quite as violent a manner as a boomerang. Uh, <laughs> I prefer to think of it as Mary Poppins, but from space. So we come back much much more gently than traditionally um, things that tend to come back from space do, meaning that we can prepare the entire thing for refurbishment, reuse, and relaunch, um, which helps us to really lower the cost. And so what will it actually do? Because obviously satellites could do lots of things. Boris Johnson was there talking about, you know, satellites could be used to, to bring super fast internet to sub-Saharan Africa without, you know, laying lots of cables and that sort of thing. It could be, you know, taking photos. What, what will this satellite be able to do? Uh, so we're focused on in-space manufacturing. So we're leveraging the microgravity, the high purity vacuum, uh, and the temperature conditions found in space to create materials which are simply impossible to make on planet Earth. Making things in space enables about a billion new alloy combinations across our known periodic table. Wow. And how will you do that? So this is a, uh, what's going up is obviously not manned this time, but could it be? Or do, would you just send up just robots? So uh, the, be the best thing for in-space manufacturing uh, beyond escaping gravity and other things is, to be honest, to get away from all the humans. <laughs> we tend to be the worst thing in the manufacturing loop. Um, so we're operating a semi-autonomous, fully robotic system, uh, which we can scale to hundreds of kilos and multiple tons to deliver enough capability that the material we produce can be produced at a capacity useful on the ground. So so explain what, so, so sort of treat me like, a bit like an idiot. Uh, well, I am an idiot. Uh, explain what sort of, what are the things that you could make that could then come back down to earth and what would they be used for? Uh, so we're focused on next generation alloys and compound semiconductors. Uh, so by producing some semiconductor technology in space, for example, when those semiconductor chips are used back on the ground, you can reduce energy consumption by more than 50% in the architecture where they're deployed. Wow. And why, just explain to me why you have to go to space to make that. Why can't you make it here apart from getting it away from dirty, hairy, dusty humans? So you can make them here, but they're not very high quality. Uh, and that comes down to the ambient atmosphere that surrounds that manufacturing process. So semiconductors uh, are, tend to be built in vacuum chambers to extract Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and it's also a, a question of gravity. So escaping both of those at the same time allows you to create much larger, single, purer crystal structures, meaning that uh, heat can escape more easily and uh, electrons can move across more freely. So that's your thing. It's about the size of a shoebox. It, to what, start, yeah. To start with, although it could get, it will get bigger. At what point do you send it from Wales to Cornwall? Uh, in a, a couple of weeks, I think. Time. Um, so we we were we were given the launch opportunity back in January. We said yes in 
February, we designed, built and qualified a satellite in that time. So we finished our qualification of that uh, about two, three weeks ago. Um, and I think I think both government and uh, Virgin Orbit have been pretty impressed that we've managed to pull it out of the bag and be ready for launch when it happens. So your, uh, your satellite goes to Cornwall. Melissa, you, let's pick up the story with you. What, what does the satellite then go on? How big is the rocket that's going to take off? Um, so the Virgin Orbit Launch One rocket is about 70 feet long um, and it carries about up to 300 kilograms of, of satellite into space. So on our first launch, we'll actually have several sh shoebox size satellites um, from sev several different companies okay. um, all over the world um, that will come to be launched in Cornwall. So they'll arrive, um, many of them on lorries, which is exciting for the first time because at the minute, all our satellites here in the UK have to be shipped overseas to launch. And so this is a great example with, with Josh's team that it can get on a lorry and come down to Cornwall instead of you know fly all over the world. And we'll be able to integrate it on site here in Cornwall into that rocket ready to go to space we'll all happen in house here in Cornwall. And uh, so as we heard from Boris Johnson when he was talking there, um, he, he was talking about the rocket taking off from Cornwall. And then later he said from um, uh, Shetland. Is it Shetland? No, Southern, well, um, David Oxley, Director of Strategic Projects. Are you there, David? Yes, I am. Definitely. I am. Thanks. You're there though as is. well. Um, explain uh, uh, the, the, what you, you do at the Space Hub. OK, so uh, for this, there's a couple of space uh, ports happening in, in Scotland at the moment. There's uh, Saxavord in Shetland and Space Hub Sutherland in Sutherland, obviously. And what we are planning to do is, is more traditional vertical rockets that will take satellites up. Uh, but these are small rockets uh, with small satellites, similar, similar size to the ones that Josh mentioned uh, that will be used for Earth observation. And what is it, it, am I um, being too simplistic to think that there's something about the fact that Cornwall is at one end of the country, Shetland's at the other end of the country. It, 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 does that make it better for, for space launches rather than doing it from, I don't know, middle of Wiltshire? Uh, you've, there's a few things that benefit from the remoter parts of, of the UK. Firstly, safety, because, you know, it is an important aspect of what we all do. We, the, the primary aspect of everything that Melissa, Melissa, Melissa himself are doing is about safety. So less people around is a good thing, but also particularly for the north of Scotland, you can access the right orbits uh, for satellites. So you, you want polar orbits, those that go over the poles, north to south, and also those sun synchronous, those are ones which look at the, uh, effectively take, can take a photo of the same location every day. Um, and and uh, so is that is that a sort of because uh, I suppose actually if you think about it in America you know you go to uh, Florida that's you know that's <laughs> literally as, almost as far east as you can get so that being being on the edge of the country is of some benefit is it um, Michelle? Oh, sorry, Melissa, Melissa. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we like to think of ourselves as the bookends <laughs> of the country <laughs> launching to space. And, you know, where where David and his team are up there in Scotland doing vertical um, and, and capturing that marketplace, us down here in Cornwall are working with, with horizontal. So we're integrating launch into an actual airport. Um, oh, hang on a minute. Hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is even more interesting. So uh, the, 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 the launches in Scotland are, are vertical rockets like we, you know, a child would draw. What's the horizontal launch look like? Um, so it basically basically uses a carrier aircraft. In our case, it's a Boeing seven four seven that straps the rocket underneath one of its one of its wings. It takes off on the runway like a normal aircraft would. It goes up to about thirty thousand feet, where it deploys the rocket midair. So it's also known as as air launch because it it actually launches midair and the rocket then goes into space. So we basically take the rocket partway to space. And what's the advantage or disadvantage of doing that as opposed to a sort of traditional in inverted commas sort of rocket going straight up? Um, I think advantages, we have a bit of flexibility in exactly where we're launching. Um, so we could go to, to different trajectories um, and weather windows as well. We're able to kind of get above the weather. So it means um, that we're less scrubs with weather. Yeah. Um, I think some of the disadvantages with some of the systems at the moment, we can't do the heavy lifts. Um, so the big, the bigger size um, payloads that you see maybe from SpaceX, for instance, with this system. So for us, it's this quality over, over quantity here in Cornwall, but for us, we're, we're just integrating into the, all the other activities at the airport already in Newquay. So there'll be passenger services flying off to the different destinations and they can look out the window and see a launch say, to space. So you could be you could be waiting to go on your holidays and see a, a rocket going past out the window. 
<laughs> well, at least the airplane that's carrying the <laughs> rocket, yeah, which is pretty impressive. So from a, I mean, an inspiration point of view, we think it's really exciting. Well, I was going to ask that, both uh, David and, um, and Melissa. Well, David, first of all, maybe, what's the point of doing all this? Because we already know we can launch rockets from Cape Canaveral or wherever it might be. Why, why go to all this trouble to try and do it from here? So the, the UK and Scotland in particular has a really strong... Uh, footprint in in space, uh, particularly with satellite manufacture in in Glasgow, for example, where Glasgow manufactures more satellites than any other any other place in Europe, um, and all of those satellites at the moment have to go to other places. So that's typically the US or Kazakhstan up until very very recently, and obviously Kazakhstan is not available uh, at the moment for Western mm. European launches. So uh, what we can actually offer with um, the likes of Space of Sutherland is a very much a bespoke service. If you've got a small satellite like Josh's, you want to launch it um, at the time you want to launch it. But if you go to Kazakhstan, for example, you're sitting on a big rocket that has got a big satellite on and you're waiting for that one to be ready. So if that gets delayed for six months, then you're delayed for six months. So the, the, the things that myself and Melissa are talking about and which are out there, sort of an Uber service for, uh, for getting see. satellites into space. It's a uh, when you're ready, we can be ready. So in, in Sutherland, we can be launching up to 12 launches uh, per annum with uh, multiple satellites on on each one. And it gets you to the right place rather than the the, uh, the sort of public transport system that you have if you go on a big <laughs> launcher. Is that is that part of the appeal, Joshua? Yeah, really, it comes down to capacity and cadence. So by 2026, Space Forge needs to be launching at least 12 missions a year. And by the end of the decade, we're looking to launch more than 100 each and every year. For us, that capacity and that cadence helps us deliver these materials to our customer. But for us, it's also the start of the next industrial revolution. Now, the UK led the last one, and here's an opportunity for us to do that again, but it's in space. And I suppose with it comes lots of uh, high paid, advanced, highly skilled jobs, Melissa. Yeah, absolutely. And for places like Cornwall and Scotland, you know, Cornwall has some of the most deprived areas in Europe. Um, and there's levels of deprivation here that, you know, we, we, we struggle down here outside of the kind of traditional hospitality and farming and fishing. So for us to bring highly skilled jobs to a place like Cornwall and really grow a skill base here um, from, from the ground up, literally up um, is, is is crucial <laughs> to really, some of these rural locations it's really interesting that, that precisely the it's precisely their geographical locations why some of these areas have struggled but it's also precisely why you could get these really high tech high skilled jobs uh, going there as well is there any prospect at all of uh, of manned flights taking off from Cornwall or, or Shetland or, or Sutherland David uh, I don't see that any time near I think we we are uh, almost boutique spaceports, as opposed to the Cape Canaverals of yeah, this yeah. world, where we'll do we we'll do what you want. Where billionaires want, go to show off. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. Absolutely, <laughs> say that. Matt, yes, and uh, no, we, we're very much more about, as, as Melissa mentioned, we want to create high value jobs that are sustainable in the long run in some of the most remote parts of of the country, and that's that's why we're doing it. it just happens to be space that enables us to do this. So, Melissa, Melissa's well, the window opens. Was it October the sixth, David? When when do when do you hope your window opens for your first launches? Uh, so we we expect to be launching next year at some point. I uh, haven't got a specific date yet, but uh, that's that's the plan. Lovely stuff. Well, best of luck with it all. Uh, we'll check we'll check in with you as well. Keep in touch and let, let us know how you get on. We'll definitely be all all eyes on Cornwall from the beginning of uh, beginning of October. 